you're going to go up this escalator and then walk back to that Gallery 211 and uh, talk about the exhibit that opened in May but will be open for a whole year. So up the escalators. Well, we are standing in part of what is called Beyond. And where did that name come from? Well, it actually starts from a book that Michael did, 2003, the same title with the subtitle, Visions of the Interplanetary Probes. And what is the show all about? Well, Michael Benson, the one who uh, put the uh, images together, is an artist, but an artist who is interested in sort of reality as viewed by an artist. So he spent years looking at tens of thousands of images on the web, selecting the ones that he liked either for their artistic view or he just thought they were striking, and got the raw data and then processed them himself to, as much as possible, give the viewer what it would be like if you were either riding on the spacecraft or standing on the surface with the spacecraft looking at these different images. So his goal was not scientific reality as much as artistic reality. And in that uh, sense, I think it's very appropriate it is in this gallery. Because while these images were collected for scientific purposes, he is viewing it through the lens, through the eye of an artist. And uh, I recognize some of the ones that he has selected from some of my scientific work, but others I hadn't seen before. And they are just jaw-dropping with the way he has processed them. Now, there is a sign at the uh, end of the uh, gallery, if you sort of make the loop, and we're going to make one other stop here in just a minute, that describes what Michael did to uh, the images. And he wants everybody to be aware that they are processed in that all of this stuff these days is digitally enhanced, although these pictures here didn't start digital. I'll get to that in uh, just a second. Um, but that processing, he tried to preserve the reality of the scene and yet, with the coloring in particular, represent what the human eye would see. Now, the spacecraft were not always designed to have that as a goal. They were measuring light in several different wavelengths for scientific purposes. And more recently, some of the scientists have begun to make a real effort to preserve human eye representation of the color. But that was not the original goal. And so Michael had to work pretty hard working with scientists at the US Geological Survey to try and reproduce colors that would make sense to the human eye. And uh, so keep that in mind. The colors that you see are slightly enhanced or exaggerated, but with the hues and at least the colors representing what the human eye would see. Um, back to how the show got to uh, this gallery. This book came out in 2003, so he was clearly thinking about this uh, whole project early in the 2000s. But uh, I got involved, actually, in about 2003. I was, at that time, chairman of what's called the Center for Earth and Planetary Studies here at the museum. And in that role, it sort of fell to me to become the liaison for Michael between the museum and himself as he was trying to get the show together. Now, last year, Michael has a second book, again called Beyond, A Solar System Voyage, and it's a lot smaller, a lot thinner. This one is sort of aimed at kind of the high school level in terms of the detail that he puts into uh, the captions that are in the book. This is the one I would, I would suggest. Um, this is a fantastic book, but particularly if you want to start with young people, that was uh, what he had in mind, but it is clearly not a grade school level book either. Um, so take a look at uh, either of these as showing you the kinds of images that were used here. Can I hand these to you? Now, what was going on in the processing? As we walked into the gallery, this wall shows Earth first and sort of in a progressive step away from it, starting with some very near views and getting further and further away from our home planet. But again, as viewed by different spacecraft, either uh, robotic spacecraft or some some cases uh, piloted missions, uh, he used some of those. When we get to the moon, these images we're kind of used to thinking about the moon from our uh, Apollo efforts. But in fact, m many of the mosaics that he has here started with prints like this. Now, this is from some of our research collections upstairs, 
And you can maybe look at this later in detail if you want. But this was taken by a, a spacecraft called Lunar Orbiter. And in fact, just outside the gallery here, if you look to the right, there is a model of what the Lunar Orbiter uh, spacecraft looks like. Well, this was early 60s. And it was to select landing areas for the Apollo missions. But it also had the uh, additional goal of mapping the moon. Um, we realized when we were finally able to put spacecraft in orbit, that would be a perspective that we just never had of our, our own nearby uh, planet. Well, the way this worked, early 60s, again, CCDs didn't exist. How do you get that information back? Well, there are several little strips. Maybe you can see the individual lines here. This was actually shot on film. The film was processed like you would, you used to do at the drugstore on the spacecraft and then scanned by something called a Viticon, which the old TV tubes that uh, were long, those had this Viticon kind of system. Well, they used that to scan and, and essentially digitize the film to be able to transmit the information back to Earth. Well, the net result is these mosaics have all of these lines in them. That's just how the image was built up line by line. Well, Michael spent a lot of time trying to remove the lines. And he did a remarkable job in, in many of these. Because in some cases, this is a high resolution image. Some of them are mosaics of many dozens of either high or moderate resolution images, all with the lines that uh, had to be removed. And you can maybe see subtle hints of what probably are some of the remnants of those processing lines. But he did a, a, a remarkable job of clear, clearing up these older 1960s era images of the moon. And he tended to choose ones that gave you perspectives very different from what we tended to see in the Apollo coverage. Because these were more global in view, um, really showing you the rugged areas of the moon and things like that. So this is some of the earliest um, material that, that uh, Michael used. And we'll, in this room, I'm not going to move there just to keep us from moving, but we'll move on to Venus and Mercury. Venus around the uh, outer wall, Mercury on the back side here. And I should have mentioned on this side are images of the sun. Not the way, again, our eye would see it this time, but in very specific wavelengths of light to allow us to see things um, that the brightness of the sun at all visual wavelengths just doesn't let us see the, the amazing um, beauty of the sun itself. So Mercury and Venus. Mercury is the result of a radar mission in the 1990s. Venus is completely cloud covered, so you can't take normal photographs uh, of the surface. But with radar, you can penetrate through the clouds. And over the four years that Magellan was operational, uh, almost 98% of the planet was uh, imaged. And, uh, he just chose examples of what that uh, surface looks like. The Mercury wall is most, I shouldn't say mostly, it includes something called Mariner 10, which in the 1970s was the first spacecraft to get to Mercury. But it also includes things from MESSENGER. MESSENGER is a spacecraft that is on its way to Mercury right now, has had three different flyby encounters with the planet, as well as uh, two with Earth. Um, and so that spacecraft will be the first one to go into orbit around Mercury next year. And once it gets in orbit, just like we saw with uh, Lunar Orbiter and the Moon, you get a very different perspective when every day you're seeing a new strip of information uh, about the planet. And uh, one of the scientists in our department is on the MESSENGER camera team, and we're very uh, excited to see what's going to be coming in there. Well, next we're going to move sort of to the middle of this back part of the gallery. And I'll just talk a little bit about the rest of the uh, images here. So we're, you maybe get the sense that we're leaving Earth past the sun, the moon, Mercury, Venus, working our way slowly into the uh, further reaches of the solar system. So this part, both this section here and all of the images on these walls are Mars. Now. Mars has been in the news a lot, mainly because there are five different spacecraft up there right now that are still active, two rovers, three orbiters. And Mars has just received an, an immense amount of attention in the last decade in particular. So many of Michael's images are of, from these recent spacecraft. Um, I think he has a couple 
that date back to some of the earlier uh, Viking and uh, Mariner uh, images and, and things like that. But the bulk of them are things that we are still getting wonderful new information right now. The latest orbiter mission to Mars includes the best camera we have ever flown to another planet, something called High Rise. And several of the people in my department are involved with that high rise camera. From orbit, it can take a digital image this time that can resolve things on the order of 25 centimeters. And that means to see the shape, literally if you were standing on Mars and casting a shadow, you could resolve both your, you standing there and your shadow uh, in this uh, camera. So it's a, a whole new way of looking uh, at Mars in particular. And uh, by the way, a very comparable camera is now in orbit around the moon. So even though Michael's images here have emphasized lunar orbiter, something called lunar reconnaissance orbiter is now changing our view of the whole moon because of this sub-meter scale resolution imaging, modern uh, digital technology. And I want to say every day something like 300 new images that are on the order of eight or so hundred megapixels per image. Any of you who are used to digital cameras, it's hundreds of times larger than what you uh, tend to be shooting. Hundreds of those are coming down each day. It's gonna change our perspective on the moon too, um, and, th and that is an ongoing mission. Well, if you continue sort of sweeping around the gallery, this next section would be Saturn. And even though as a geologist, Mars has been one of my areas of of study, Saturn is one of my favorite planets. It has been since I was a kid because of those magnificent rings. Well, the Cassini images are just mind-blowing of what the rings look like. And again, Michael chose ones that have scientific value, but they really present the rings as art. In particular, one uh, on the far wall where you're looking at these two golden bands almost sticking up above the uh, planet. I still remember the first time I saw that coming from Michael. Uh, I just I said, where did you get that? I've never seen that view before. Um, so I, I'm really grateful to Michael to bring my sort of science eyes to be able to see an artistic representation of some of these things as well. When we get to the outer solar system, uh, Saturn and Jupiter um, and Uranus and Neptune, not only the planets and their clouds, but many of their moons become very important. And so through the rest of the gallery, the moons of the major planets become important players. And there are dozens to talk about. Now, Michael clearly only picked a few examples, but I think it will give you a feel for the diversity in the outer solar system. As you work your way back towards the entrance uh, area, there are a couple of panels, one of which describes how Michael did the mosaicing process. One talks about Michael as an artist and, uh, and a little bit of information about why he chose to do this. Just part of his motivation was the last 50 or so years has been this time of robotic exploration of the solar system. And it is, it's a chance to celebrate it. I think that's really what Michael is trying to do, not only in his books, but in the images. And some of these digital things are so large, it's hard to appreciate that on a computer screen. I realize that when I have seen some of these things on my screen, but his pictures blown up and enlarged are even more dramatic than what you tend to get uh, just on a computer monitor. So that was a real quick introduction uh, to the gallery. I would encourage you to spend time looking at each one and just kind of take in. He has very simple captions to just give you an idea of what you're looking at, but he wants you to experience too and, and just uh, see what you see out of his images. Thank you for listening to this edition of Ask an Expert. A companion question and answer session for this lecture may also be available. For a schedule of upcoming Ask an Expert lectures at the museum, please visit www.nasm.si.edu.